Manchester Airport, the 4th of June, 1967. A cold, damp Sunday morning. Like any other day at any other airport, there are people just waiting. In this case, waiting for friends and relations to arrive on British Midland Airways Flight 542 from Parma, Majorca. At this moment, the aircraft, an Argonaut, is on its final approach into Manchester. What you're seeing now is a recreation of what happened, except for the voice of the pilot that was actually recorded at the time. You will hear him as the controller did that Sunday morning. Hotel Golf, six miles from Touchdown, established. Hotel Golf, radar, do you read? Um, Hotel Golf is overshooting. We've got a little bit of trouble with our field. Hotel Golf, make a left turn onto a heading of 160, climbing to 2500 feet, Cairn Edge. Hotel Golf Radar, why are you overshooting? Ah, uh, we've got a little bit of uh, trouble with um, RPM, but that's fine, you. Hotel Golf, continue your right turn now, onto a heading of 020, climbing to 2500 feet, GNH1025. Hotel Golf, advise when you're ready to recommence your approach. Only the controller here at Manchester and the crew of the aircraft knew at this moment that the Argonaut Golf Alpha Lima Hotel Golf had turned away and for some reason was going round in a right-hand circle over Stockport before coming into land. And only the crew knew why. Hotel Golf, your position is seven miles, bearing 040 the field. What is your level now? Hotel Golf. Understand 1000? Roger. Roger, turn right, heading 180. Hotel Golf, can you maintain height? Uh, just about. Roger, you are eight miles from touchdown. Continue your right turn now, heading 200. Maintain as much height as possible. Hotel Golf, we're unable to maintain height at the moment. Roger, you are eight miles from touchdown, closing from the right. Hotel Golf, I've lost radar contact with you due to your height. Adjust your heading on the ILS and report established. We have the legs to our right, and we're 800 feet this time, just maintaining height. Roger, Hotel Golf. Hotel Golf, will you get the emergency on? Affirmative, the emergency has already been laid on. I now have contact with you six miles from touchdown. How far? Six miles from touchdown. Hotel Golf, we're now 500 feet. Roger, your height should be 1850 feet. Hotel Golf, Hotel Golf, no radar contact. Hotel Golf Radar, do you read? Golf Alpha Lima, Hotel Golf Radar, do you read? Six miles away from the airport, the aircraft had crashed in the centre of Stockport. Some people died on impact, others in the fire which followed. Altogether, 72 people lost their lives. No one on the ground was hurt. Only 12 people on board survived, including the pilot and stewardess. Why did it happen? Board of Trade investigators began work within a few hours. Their inquiry was to become long and difficult. Today, more than a year later, the reasons why are made public. One of the first things they did was to find witnesses. Hotel Golf crashed close to Stockport Town Centre, six miles from the runway at Manchester Airport. Three minutes before the crash, Hotel Golf had been heading north to reposition for a second approach. A Manchester policeman, Alan Faulkner, saw the Argonaut passing near his house in Gorton. On that Sunday morning, I'd returned from a friend's home. The weather was, it had been raining, cloud was low, but uh, it was quite dry. And the, the sound of a piston engine aircraft flying at low altitude attracted my attention. And I looked over into this direction by the, between the two rows of houses. It was at about three, four hundred feet, certainly no more the large BM on the tailplane attracted my attention and, and just on the fuselage below the tailplane were the words Canadair 4 and then the plane came out over 
in an arc towards Audenshaw Reservoir, flying with its nose lifted, tail down, a slight rocking, but nothing uh, untowards. It certainly didn't make me think the plane was going to crash immediately or in the future. It seemed a plane in trouble, but uh, that was managing quite all right. The plane then appeared to continue turning back towards Manchester Airport. Four miles further on, Hotel Golf was seen by an official from the gas board, Desmond Ray. I was in the house at the time and the aircraft appeared to pass over and the engine sounded very loud. I came out into the back garden and saw the aircraft just about here. There was nothing sound abnormal about it, apart from it being very low. I could make out the name on the side, British Midland, and the letters BM on the tail fin. The aircraft tried to gain height as it was going up towards Orton Green, and then it seemed to trail off down behind the houses and seemed to dip down very low over the second telegraph pole just beyond. Hotel Golf turned into the approach path of Manchester Airport. It completed its circle and was then in a direct line for a landing on the main runway. Nose up, tail down, obviously flying very slowly just before it hit the ground. But no mention of fire and no suggestion of pieces falling off the aircraft. Lower and lower, it avoided a gasometer and flew towards two blocks of flats and a hospital. Whether by luck or by skill of the pilot, it hit nothing. It flew on as far as Hope's car, an open sight behind a garage. And here, finally, it crashed. Within seconds, the airliner had become a heap of tangled wreckage. By chance, the first man to arrive was somebody who knew what to do. Bill Oliver is a Stockport policeman. About uh, ten past ten on the morning of the crash, I was riding this motorcycle along Waterloo Road uh, towards that direction, when I saw the plane, uh, which would only then be about 50 or 60 feet in the air, with the left hand wing higher than the right, coming diagonally towards me. Uh, I knew it was going to crash, and I turned to my right, as I thought it would hit the buildings that I was coming up against. Uh, I, I, the plane crashed, I uh, stopped, radioed the police headquarters and ran down to, uh, to this part here. There was uh, one man, about 50 odd years of age, who was staggering away from the plane and about five yards clear from it, close to where those petrol pumps are. And behind him, uh, the plane had split open with the cockpit being almost severed and uh, between 20 and 30 people exposed to view. Um, as I got closer to it, I could see that a girl had started to move and uh, I went into it, got her out and then uh, just carried on moving people away from it until uh, this plane exploded and caught fire. From the investigator's point of view, the eyewitnesses have not helped very much, but they still have plenty to go on to establish the cause. Mechanical failure or human error? And what was the failure, if any? Or what was the error? One vital witness was dragged from the remains of the flight deck. Miraculously, the pilot survived and was soon out of hospital. Captain Harry Marlow is 42. He's been flying since he was 19. He's been flying the route to Palmer for nine years. His memory of the flight might have cleared up the mystery, or at least given the investigators the lead they needed. His first officer cannot help because he was killed. Captain Marlow can remember that the flight was uneventful up to the time that they passed over Congleton in Cheshire. His head was injured when the nose of the aircraft broke up, and now at home in Nottingham, where he lives with his wife and two children, he can remember nothing of the last few minutes. No evidence then from the captain, apart from his conversation with the controller that he was having a little RPM trouble. In other words, difficulty with the speed of at least one engine. This and the fact that Hotel Golf had been losing speed and height suggested trouble with the engines or propellers. So from the wreckage, they disentangled the propellers. Move, 
The propellers were taken by the Accidents Investigation Branch to the Hawker Sidley workshops at Stevenage. In hospital, Captain Marlowe had remembered just enough to ask which engine was it. These propellers might give the answer. And not only the blades, but more important, the mechanism which allows the pilot to control them. Eric Newton, a Board of Trade investigating officer. This is the root end of a propeller blade, and in order to determine the pitch angle, as it wasn't possible to determine this from the damaged uh, propeller blades, we had to resort to impact markings made when the blade struck the ground, and these are clearly defined on the soft root end shim plates, and by mating these to the spider of the propeller, we were able to determine the pitch angle of the propeller. And it's from this method we were able to determine that number four propeller was feathered. The mechanism is designed so that the angle of blades can be altered in flight, each blade being made to rotate so that it meets the air at a coarser or finer angle. Should an engine fail, the pilot will feather the blades with a special control to stop the propellers rotating in the airflow. This is number four propeller, a variable pitch propeller of American manufacture, established had been in the feathered position, whilst numbers one, two, and three were in the normal operating pitch. Tests and examinations have shown no evidence of mechanical failure, uh, no evidence of going into reverse pitch. So there we are. One, two, and three in normal pitch, and number four propeller feathered but we don't know why. Now the investigators were getting somewhere. One of Hotel Gulf's four propellers was feathered. This suggested an engine failure, but the airliner should have had no difficulty in reaching the airport safely on its other three engines. Somewhere among all this wreckage were the Merlin engines. They were found, battered and buried, and hoisted up to be taken away to be examined. the Scottish aviation base at Prestwick. Here, Rolls-Royce engineers stripped the four Merlins down to their 3,000 individual parts. Four long tables were laid out side by side to take all the individual parts, each one of which was to be cleaned, checked, and in some cases, x-rayed. Rolls-Royce designed the Merlin engine for the Hurricane and Spitfire, and Eric Newton himself was investigating accidents on Merlin engines during the war. Engines one and two on the port side, three and four on the starboard side. From the impact marking, they could say which engines were running and which engines were not. They confirmed that number four engine had been stopped, and they made a new discovery about number three engine. It was probably windmilling. That is, the propeller was being turned by the airflow and not by the engine. They established, however, that there was no mechanical reason for the failure of these two engines. With the wreckage cleared away one month later, the public began to forget Argonaut Hotel Golf. Now the investigators knew there were no quick answers. It would be a long job. They now thought that the airliner had been flying with two out of its four engines out of action, for no obvious reason. Had something else happened, something in the cabin, something the passengers would have noticed. By this time, most of the 12 survivors had recovered, and the investigators spoke to them all. Among them, a 15-year-old schoolgirl. Her friend died. A young man from the Midlands, his holiday companion, also survived. Two brothers from Lancashire. Their father was killed. The hostess, Julia Partleton, she escaped with severe burns. They remembered the horror, but very little that helped. Today, some of them are still haunted by it. But when the site of the crash had been cleared, four of the survivors returned to the place where they had so nearly been killed. Unlike some of the survivors, they were able to talk about it and explain what happened. It was a very cloudy, very drizzly Sunday morning and suddenly the cloud lifted and I could see the rooftops of houses 
and it suddenly dawned on me that it was the plane was very low, too low, and then I I remember it just dropping like a stone. There was never any panic on board or anything. And the next thing I remember were flames coming from the cockpit towards me, which made me scream. And then somebody was at the right-hand side of me, and with their hands under my arms, trying to pull me out, and I was screaming that my legs were trapped. And then I lost, lost all consciousness until I was in Stockport Infirmary. We'd seen the airport, and I thought it was a long time getting over the airport. So I looked through the window. I looked through the window, saw just the plane coming, and I thought, he'll never make it. And uh, after that, well, I just, I didn't, of course. And I um, just woke up halfway down my seat and saw Mary on the floor of the side. That was all. So we got in the hospital, seeing the... I just saw the wing and the seats in front, just a few seats in front and the wing. Oh, no! Nah! And then these two men running. And then I went out again. I don't remember any of it after, after that. Well, the flight was quite normal, except that it was very warm. And... Um... The first time I realised that there was anything wrong was when I looked through the window and noticed this gasometer, sort of on a level. And uh, then the plane seemed to come straight down. It came plop down. And that strange feeling you have when you go to the dentist and, you know, everything goes round. Well, it felt like that. And there seemed to be a lot of bangings and noises. And um, then I must have blacked out. And the next thing I know, uh, Mrs. Parry, who was sitting next to me, said, um, will you uh, unfasten your seatbelt? And then there was a man leaning over me. I realised afterwards he was a policeman. And uh, he asked me to undo the seatbelt. But I couldn't use either arm. So he must have got me undone, because when I looked down, I was on fire down one side. And I thought, I'm going to be roasted here, and um, because I couldn't get myself out. And then he carried me away from the aeroplane, and he was stepping over bodies as he went and um, put me in the back of a police car and uh, I went to the hospital from there. We flew away from Manchester Airport. We thought this was very strange. And the next thing we remember seeing was the houses and the gasometer and the flats and everything around Stockport. And we weren't told anything, that anything was wrong at all. And. Um, then the plane just started to lose height, and really that's all that um, we knew, because there was, as far as we could see, nothing was wrong with the plane. Nothing had happened to go wrong, there was no panic or anything. And then, after that, the plane just gradually lost more height. Then I must have lost consciousness, because I don't remember anything until we were dragged out of the plane. I remember lying outside the plane and hearing people screaming and people rushing towards the plane and smelling smoke and hearing the fire crackle. That's really about all. Really, it seems all very unbelievable. You don't really think that it's happened to you. To stand here and think that so many people were involved in such a tragedy at that time. As factual evidence to help an inquiry, the survivors' memories added nothing and gave no answer to the main question. Why were two engines out of action? However, here in the tail of the aircraft, relatively undamaged, they did find a witness. Here they found the flight recorder in one piece. In this case, not a black box, but a bright orange ball. The Midas recorder was taken to Royston Industries headquarters at Byfleet in Surrey. Built to withstand almost any crash, it was undamaged, and if, as they hoped, it had done its job, then they would know what had happened, if not why. Opened by a Royston technician under the eye of a Board of Trade investigator, Geoffrey Felton, it was found that the thin recording tape was still intact and had apparently been running. Now they could take that tape and play it back. Not a recording of what was said on the flight deck, but a record of facts about the performance of the aircraft, its height, direction, speed, its timing of every alteration. It could tell the investigators more of what happened in the last minutes of Hotel Golf and when the pilot lost the power of two engines. On this tape, they hoped to find the information that Captain Marlow had been unable to tell them. Information that only someone, or in this case, something inside the aircraft could know. 
During those last few minutes of the flight, most of the relevant information about the aircraft had been fed into this recorder and into another one at the same time. Not built to withstand damage, but it had survived. This recorder had been found a week later, trapped in the wreckage. So there were two tapes to provide a double check. And here comes the first part of the information. Date, time, aircraft. Now the flight information. A long paper chart with moving pens drawing out second by second the movements which Hotel Golf made as it turned away from its final approach into Manchester and made that complete 360 degree turn. From left to right, the compass heading, next the relative time scale, then a rough recording of the altitude, then a fine record of the same thing, a rough record of air speed, and lastly a fine record of air speed. And as the needles jump across the paper, you can see the moment of impact. Now, from then on, there was nothing to record. And now the work began. The analysis stage by stage of each separate line. What they record and what they actually mean. Well, this looks like the end of the trace here, the point of impact. Um, let me see, that's, that's where the pins drop down, is it? That's, that's fine. Yes. Um, that's altitude, fine, yeah. of course. Um, just a moment, what scale, what, what paper speed have we got here? 10 millimetres uh, per second? 10 millimetres a second. Fine. fine. So that's, that much there is 40 seconds. Yes, fine. Ooh. Well, we've got a complete 360 degree turn here, apparently, haven't we? Yeah, well, um, no, not a complete 360 degree. It goes from west through from north. north. No, I mean the total. This is a complete 360 here. Ah, yes. 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 No, through the, the, yes. Area the flight recorder information took many weeks to analyse. Then it was possible to say from this chart with some certainty that Hotel Golf had lost power on two engines within 20 seconds of each other, seven minutes before the crash. About the time when the captain radioed that he had trouble with RPM. East Midlands Airport at Castle Donington. Here it was decided three months after the crash that they would use what they had discovered from the flight recorder to fly another Argonaut owned by British Midland and examine the situation which may have faced Hotel Golf. The wind dropped, so now they could make this potentially risky attempt. The chief pilot of British Midland and the chief test pilot of the Air Registration Board, together with the investigators who were in charge of the test. No passengers, but enough sandbags to simulate exactly the same load that had been carried by Hotel Golf. At exactly what speed would the aircraft stall? carrying this amount of weight. How would it behave at very low speed with two engines stopped? Would it have been possible for Captain Marlow to have reached Manchester? climbed high up to give themselves plenty of airspace underneath and they flew over the most deserted countryside they could find. First thing to be checked and recorded was the stall, the moment when the aircraft flies so slowly that the wing stops providing enough lift to keep it flying. The engines were throttled back until the speed had dropped so low that the airflow began to break away from the wings, buffeting the whole aircraft. And still they held the nose up until the speed dropped below 100 miles an hour. The airflow broke away from the wings and the nose dropped. Open the throttle, ease forward on the controls, and with increased speed, the aircraft comes straight and level again and flies on. Now the captain cuts one engine and feathers the propeller so that it comes to a standstill. This is how Hotel Golf would have been with only one engine stopped and the propeller as it was found after the crash. No difficulty. Hotel Yankee holds height and remains on course until the engine is started again.
Now the big test. They will feather one propeller, allow another to windmill, and fly the plane on the other two engines only. What they're about to do is to establish the lowest speeds at which a pilot could keep an Argonaut under control in this situation. The starboard engines are throttled back and the aircraft slows down. And as it slows down, the captain has to use all his strength to hold the aircraft straight. He can only just manage to hold the aircraft straight, but he loses height and he's flying right on the edge of the stall and dangerously near to spinning. safety they start up number four engine but run it at the lowest possible power. Meanwhile the port engines are running at full power. This was the situation which faced Captain Marlow approaching the airport only a few hundred feet up. Starboard engines out, one feathered and one windmilling causing aircraft drag on one side still losing height. The crew of this aircraft are ready and prepared for what is happening. They aren't in the middle of a landing approach, trying to keep straight towards an airfield, talking on the radio, worrying about navigational instruments, and trying to find out why their engines have stopped. So, Hotel Yankee has behaved just in the way they believed Hotel Golf behaved over Stockport. Double check, the flight recorder comes out so that its record can be compared with the first one from Hotel Golf. For the pilot, the test flight had lasted a long two and a half hours. They have confirmed what they believe to be true, but discovered nothing new. They are no further forward. What nobody knows still is why those two engines should have stopped when there was nothing mechanically wrong with either of them. The reason has to be found, because whatever it is, it might affect another aircraft carrying another load of passengers. Farnborough Royal Aircraft Establishment. Here they brought the wreckage of Hotel Golf. Here, where the relics of other air crashes all lie together. The wreckage from Stockport was taken inside the hangar and reassembled. At this stage, it was necessary to look at the airliner as a whole. All sections of Hotel Golf were gathered together. Engines, propellers, wings, fuselage and tail. 
The entire aircraft was then rebuilt piece by piece. The remains of the flight deck from which Captain Marlow was dragged alive. It was one of the investigators, Richard Clark, who took on the job of rebuilding the wreck almost single-handed. And here in the flight deck, he made a discovery which might have been important. Richard Clark explained. This is the engine instrument panel and we are particularly interested in the engine RPM indicators. This one shows numbers one and two engines, this numbers three and four. What was uh, rather non-plussing went on test. This one worked all right, but number three and four, which is a dual point as you can probably see, when number four motor was actuated, number three needle moved. This again was a bit uh, odd, so we then found, when we turned the harness round the opposite direction, number three to number four and vice versa, the needles then worked in their correct sense. On strip, we then found that the gearbox driving pinions from each motor to each needle had been reversed and consequently this was put right when you reversed the harness. It was a red herring, unfortunately. But this wasn't a red herring. This is the rudder trim tab, a small control surface on the back of the rudder. The tab is designed to reduce pressure on the pilot's rudder pedals. If it was true that Captain Marlow had been having any trouble holding the aircraft straight, then the trim tab would probably have been set well off centre. It was, and not only the tab itself. When Richard Clark inspected the flight deck, he found further evidence. This is a bit awkward to get at, to show you. the. This is the rudder tab, rudder tab wheel here at the top, and underneath is the indicator. And this indicator shows 12 degrees nose left and in confirms the setting of the tab at the rudder itself. So reconstructing the entire airliner has produced no further clues. But something new did come to light the fire appeared to have burned more fiercely on the port wing than on the starboard. From the point of view of preventing another accident like this from happening, the team was still no further on than it had been on that first Sunday morning. And the pressure was growing for the public inquiry to be started. What the captain had described as a little bit of RPM trouble was just as much of a mystery now as it had ever been. If the second pilot had lived, or if Harry Marlow had been able to remember, they might have been able to solve it in a matter of minutes. All the investigators could really tell the public inquiry was that Hotel Golf had crashed with two engines out on the starboard wing. But they couldn't tell why. Was there any significance in the lesser fire damage on the starboard wing? Had they run out of fuel? Certainly they'd left Palmer with enough fuel to spare, and anyway, if they had run out of fuel, why had two engines kept going until they ploughed into the ground? With the opening of the public inquiry only a few weeks off, the investigators decided to re-examine the fuel logs of the British Midland Argonaut fleet. And from this came an entirely new line of thinking. Castle Donington again, and another Argonaut was being used to carry out another check on the sparking plugs from the number three engine of Hotel Golf, the engine which windmilled. There was some doubt about the state these plugs were in, but they were proved to be all right. With the aircraft available, Captain Fenton, the chief pilot of BMA, and the flight safety officer, Captain Wallace, with the investigators, had decided to test a long shot. 
They put fuel into the main and two auxiliary tanks, started up all four engines, and then, while the aircraft was on the ground, they moved the two levers controlling the flow of fuel from different tanks to different engines to see if it might be possible for the fuel to be drained out of one tank into another without the pilot knowing. Engineers said it couldn't happen, but the investigators had their doubts. Certainly it was worth trying. This was what they decided to do. The cross-feed lever that allows any engine to draw fuel from any tank was left open just a fraction of an inch, a gap that neither pilot could see from where he sat. The four engines ran together, steadily using up fuel. If there was any truth in the theory, then sooner or later one tank would run dry and the engine would stop. Just a matter of waiting to see what would happen. And if an engine did stop, which one it would be. And it was engine number four. They didn't know it at the time, but with this discovery, four months after the crash, they had come within sight of the end of the investigation. The key to the Stockport air disaster was in the crossfeed lever and that gap of a quarter of an inch. From this test and others like it, the investigators were able to say that if the crossfeed cock is left not quite shut, then fuel can be pumped from one tank to another, probably in all directions. This could explain why fire damage was greater on the port wing. There was less petrol in the starboard wing. But it didn't explain why number three engine was windmilling, unless the fuel pumps were pumping in air from the empty tank of number four. And that was basically all that was known when the public inquiry opened at Burlington House in London in November, nearly six months after the crash. An inquiry at which every known fact was to be brought out, every relevant detail. An independent chairman, two independent assessors, evidence from the board's own investigators, representatives of the airline and the makers, Canada, lawyers, engineers, experts on every aspect of flying. There were maps to show where the aircraft was at every stage, papers and documents of all kinds. And among all the people there were two whose interest in the inquiry was rather different from the others. Mrs. Marlow, the captain's wife, and the one man with more personal interest in the case than anybody else, Harry Marlow. For more than three weeks, Captain Marlow was to sit there and listen to the background to that one flight. The basic evidence was given day after day until finally they came to the crossfeed levers and the way they had affected the flow of fuel from the tanks. The inquiry seized on this and ordered further tests and adjourned until those tests were complete. The investigation had already cost thousands of pounds. It was now to cost even more. Another British Midland Argonaut was taken to Boscombe Down and here the fuel system underwent the most intensive testing that could be devised. They uncoupled the engines from the fuel pipes and replaced them with special pumps to draw off the fuel at the rate the engines would use it in flight. With this machinery, they could discover not only how much fuel was being used from each tank, but if there was any cross-feeding going on, where it was coming from, where it was going, and how much.
four rates on it done. Four eleven. Flights were simulated with the crossfeed levers closed and with them just that quarter of an inch open. Tank pressures were recorded and compared. All this was done to discover if a distinct possibility could be actually proved beyond doubt. Proof was important to Captain Marlow as well. Perhaps after these tests, at last, Marlow would actually know what had happened during those seven minutes. They continued with the test rig. They also ran tests with the engines running for long periods. Tests that would have been impossible in anything but this freezing weather, because the engines would have overheated. Engineers took it in turn to stand in the wheel well behind the propeller. Metal pipes had been replaced by transparent tubes so that they could watch for bubbles which would mean that air had entered the system. If air had been flowing as well as fuel, then that might have been the cause of number three engine having stopped as well as number four. This was what was left in number four tank at the end of a test with the crossfeed levers just not quite shut. And this was what they found when they drained the other three main tanks. This alone was probably enough evidence for Harry Marlow. It was almost enough for the investigators. Number four engine died because of lack of fuel. But they still didn't know why number three failed, and the air bubble theory had been totally disproved. After all this, back to Burlington House to resume the public inquiry. And now it is March, nine months after the crash. For two weeks, the public inquiry faced the puzzle of what had happened to number three engine. When the public inquiry closed, the assessors took over and for several months more sifted and evaluated all the evidence. Today comes their official report. And this is what it says. Number four engine did stop because of fuel starvation. Number three engine may have stopped for the same reason, or for a different one. And what you're going to see now is what might have happened on the flight deck of Hotel Golf during the last seven minutes before the crash. Assume that this crossfeed lever had been left just off the stops at some stage in the flight. Neither pilot could see the gap, but because of it, fuel would be drained out of number four tank by other engines until it ran dry. However, number four engine would continue to run by drawing fuel back again through the accidentally open crossfeed cock. A pilot approaching and landing checks as a routine that the crossfeed levers are closed. If they had been open, if they had then been closed, number four engine would stop, its tank empty. At this point, suppose the pilot wrongly identifies the engine which has failed as number three. He tells his first officer to close the throttle turn off the switches and feather number three. There's very little indication on this panel of which engine has lost power. Until the engine's feathered, the propeller still goes round. But as soon as number three is shut down, he realizes from the way the aircraft is flying that it was the wrong engine. He needs both hands to hold it straight. 
so he tells the first officer to cut out and feather number four to reduce the drag of a windmilling propeller. After that, he must restart number three. The throttles are opened and the engine is unfeathered. But the captain himself has already turned off the fuel to number three when he thought it had stopped. Now he has his hands full and he hasn't time to reach forward and open the fuel to number three engine. You remember that he needed full rudder trim to keep the aircraft straight with one propeller feathered and one windmilling and that's what he has now. The first officer would have to undo his straps, leave his seat and move right across the flight deck and open the vital barrel. And who knows, perhaps there wasn't time. If he didn't have time to get that fuel on again, then what happened was understandable. This might well have happened, but there was no evidence that it did. The report says it cannot decide whether the failure of number three engine was due to fuel starvation or to misidentification. How important is this report to air travel today? Airlines all over the world have now been warned of the dangers of accidental cross-feeding. The warning is relevant to nearly a thousand aircraft now in service, including DC-4s, DC-6s and DC-7s, Carvairs and Constellations. The report says failure of communication was a major contributory cause of the Stockport crash. BOAC discovered this cross-feed danger 15 years ago in 1953 and told the makers Canadair about it. Canadair apparently told no airlines and didn't change their flight manuals. Aer Lingus and the independent airline Invicta also knew about the danger. Others didn't. In 1953, there was no machinery for sharing information of this kind among the airlines. Today, there is. Today, stewardess Julia Partleton is flying again for a living with British Midland Airways. It took her months to recover from her injuries but now she's completely fit. And finally, Captain Marlow. There is no reflection on him in the report. But because his injuries make him permanently unfit, his license has been cancelled. He may never fly again. Hotel Golf, continue your right turn now, heading 200.